So I'm going to call the, the uh, what day is this? May, May Thursday, May 5th. This is uh, Board of Health meeting new order. Um, we're going to move public comment to later because uh, we need to get some people out. Uh, first thing, first order of business is approval of the March 31st meeting minutes. Does anybody have any comments or corrections? I move we accept the minutes. Steve, All second. Steve and Mark have moved and second it. Uh, now we do have to roll call again since we're hybrid. Um, George, you'll have to at least, let's see, is Lee, is Lee elevated uh, yet? That's a good yeah. legal question. You're all here in the room. I think you could vote and then just get George's verbally. Okay. But, oh, hey, Lee. <laughs> we oh. had... We had a process question since we're hybrid and they're taking a vote. Mm -hmm. Do they still need to, to call everybody's name individually or can they vote as a group here and then just ask the person that's on Zoom? So uh, when we do a hybrid meeting, uh, votes have to be taken by roll call. Okay. Okay. So we'll take it by roll call. We're gonna ask George first. We're voting on approval of the minutes, George. Yes. Yes, Steve. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So our first report uh, today, public, we're doing public health reports, is our IU, and Kirk White is here to join us. Thanks for coming. Good afternoon. It's uh, good to see you all. I wish you could be there in person. Uh, too many meetings stacked well, hold up. On, hold on a second, Kirk. We're having some trouble hearing you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? It, it might be on our end. I'll keep uh, keep talking to see if uh, that works. Uh, and uh, while we get your get our uh, volume uh, adjusted, is that any better? Hang on a second, Kirk. We're still having trouble hearing you. Okay. No. No. Barely. 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 Is it just feel like the, the you know, it's, it's, coming, it's coming okay. through the computer, not the TV. Yeah. yeah. We just approved the minutes. I can hear Kirk fine. I can too. You're probably all on your uh, speaker systems at your. Does that work? Now try it. Try again, Kirk. Okay. How does that sound? Any better? Yeah, no, no, not yet. Okay. Still trying to get yeah. the right plugs in the uh, in the right okay. sockets there. I understand. The wonders of tech. Now try. Okay, try again, Kirk. Okay, how does that sound? Any better? It's oh, worse. Worse. <laughs> worse. worse. Okay. So you know, I I think all of our boards and commissions are going through the technical uh, challenges right now to to be these do these hybrid meetings. It's understandable, but it's uh, it's good for everybody to be able to participate. Okay. We got, we got it. We got it. You're good. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and get started then. I think everybody knows. Uh, uh, my name's Kirk White. I work in uh, Bloomington Campus Administration, and uh, uh, I've been uh, co-chair of our COVID response unit this past uh, couple of years. And again, I want to thank you all for uh, all your support as we've uh, continued to uh, adjust what we're doing at the campus and in the community. I think everybody knows that uh, we're going to be able to celebrate uh, commencement this weekend. Uh, graduate school commencement is tomorrow afternoon. It will be indoors at Assembly Hall, and we've double checked to make sure, you know, uh, we're still in that mask optional category uh, due to uh, the infection rates, uh, but we will uh, have masks available at the entrances to Assembly Hall for the, for the ceremonies. We want, uh, want people to feel comfortable wearing them and have them. They're available if they, uh, forgot them or thought maybe not to worry about it, but then changed their mind and do want to wear a mask. Uh, 
so we'll we'll do that. And then on Saturday, hopefully, if the weather cooperates, the commencement ceremonies will be held uh, on Saturday morning outside at Memorial Stadium, and so there'll be much less uh, chance of uh, transmission in the outdoor venue. And hopefully, weather will cooperate, so we don't have to move it indoors. Um, we have seen uh, this past week uh, a high level of flu A on the campus. In fact, uh, this past week, the, the flu A numbers at our health center were higher uh, for one period at least uh, than, than the COVID numbers were. So uh, flu A is certainly there and uh, the health center was very busy with appointments. Now this week we're seeing an uptick in, in, uh, in cases of, uh, of COVID, some uh, uptick a bit in positive. So um, it's evened out a bit more. Uh, we're still keeping a close eye on things um, and uh, testing is still available uh, on the campus. Uh, we're not testing as much as we used to because of the numbers that have gone down and, and the high vaccination rate, uh, but we're continuing to offer uh, testing and uh, at least through May, we'll continue to process those uh, in our own uh, lab on campus. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, well, we've got, I uh, wanted to let you know, just in terms of COVID, we do have uh, uh, 10 students in isolation right now. So uh, they're, uh, we're working with them closely to make sure that they uh, get that, those five days uh, in isolation and still able to complete the semester on time. Uh, we'll have uh, vaccinations available at least through June at our student health center. So faculty, staff, and students can make an appointment um, to get uh, their flu, their uh, uh, COVID vaccine or booster. Uh, we've got Pfizer available at uh, least through the end of June. So uh, we've got that on our websites. Just make an appointment at the health center for students, faculty, and staff. That takes a bit of the uh, demand off of um, the local uh, outlets. And then finally, um, we are making plans for, for summer and fall. Uh, this summer, we'll have a significant number of conferences come back for the first time in a couple of years. Uh, we've asked those conferences to make contingency plans in case uh, our guests uh, do test positive uh, or come down with COVID. Um, we will uh, continue to have isolation uh, and quarantine available for our full-time students that are in our residence hall system uh, at uh, during the summer sessions. That's a relatively low number, uh, probably around a thousand, but we still wanna have that available. And then we're thinking about what to do for fall. Uh, of course, it's hard to predict what COVID will do, as we all know, but uh, since we've got the structures in place, we wanna be ready uh, no matter what uh, the numbers start to show us as the summer goes on and we get ready for August. So uh, I guess finally, um, I would I would ask uh, I, Penny. I don't know if you guys are talking today about how the the um, the wastewater rates have gone up that that those infection rates, and uh, I think it'd be a good idea for us to to think about how um, we might continue that testing. Um, yeah, actually, and there, actually, Kurt, we're we're going to show it. We have a we have a graph to show if you want. We can show it. We can put that up. Yeah, we're, we're hopeful as well. Um, we might have some additional capabilities on the campus this summer with um, um, a new faculty member that will be joining us. So um, we may be able to help with uh, some of the analysis as well. But I think uh, considering how the numbers in the community have really uh, popped up here in the last, uh, this last few days, um, I was talking to uh, Vic Kelson earlier and we, might want to ask uh, how we we might um, might want to uh, test more often, since the community is not testing at the same levels that it used to. This is really one of our best indicators. That's all of my report. Actually, we, we can't show it. Yeah, she's having trouble sharing. Well, the, I have it here. Here I have it. This is for y'all to see. Yeah, it it is on CBU's um, website, okay, okay, so, so you, you can. You can see the increase. Yeah. These are not, these are actual run numbers. This is it's both both sides have gone up, but the uh, Blucher pool side has gone up higher. That's the north side. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that, that has that covers IU. 
Um, they've both gone up quite a bit, but the, the, the north side has gone up considerably more. So it's, it's interesting to see if there's any correlation with what's going to be what's going to happen in terms of positive cases in the next few days. Yeah, right now, and I agree and have talked with Vic Kelson from uh, CBU as well, Kirk, that you know, this is a good, hopefully an indicator. Right now, it's kind of that monitoring to see how, what we expect we might see if that holds true. So if we see these increases and then if we continue to see an increase in cases that follows. Um, so I agree that with less testing that these water samples may very well be a very important tool that we have if we can do more testing. Pat's that one. This, this newer yes. number. Oh, that's yeah. newer. Oh. Yeah, those are newer oh. numbers than the ones you have in your packet. Yeah, they're uh, they're up uh, pretty close to where they were in January. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to share that. With, I want to make sure you the board. I want to make sure the board saw that. And that yeah. I'm glad you addressed it. Thank you. Yeah. Now the only thing I you know the good news is that and I check weekly too with the hospital. Our hospital numbers are, are low and those are pretty stable. So we're not seeing, not that there aren't people with severe disease, but we're not seeing the severe disease and hospitalizations that we saw with the last surge. So yeah, some, some, of, some of our folks have said that uh, the uh, this BA2 12.1 is 30% more contagious than the the BA2, but it doesn't seem to be as serious, which is a good thing. Yeah, so I, mean, I think that's the real issue. As long as we have the medical resources, and then we don't need to panic. Yeah, I'd be curious about, um, you know, people that are, are really getting sick, but but not to the hospitalization point. Is, or, or is this just becoming sort of um, just a, like a flu bug? that gets people down for 72 hours or? Most of the people I've talked to, I mean, I've, unfortunately, I've talked to people who've had it recently and, and they're sick for like two to five days, not some low grade, like medium, yeah. like 102 type fevers, yeah. cold symptoms. I mean, they're, they're, they're not feeling, I mean, they feel pretty crappy, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, they're not, the respiratory component, okay. which is what gets people. You know, so that's what takes people out is respiratory stuff. That hasn't been quite as severe other than some cough, but not the. I have two or three friends that have it. They're my age, so they're low 70s. Yeah, and then they're, and they're not feeling well. The rise in RNA and wastewater is about a five day lag. Birds, you're going to see, uh, see about five days between the rise in the wastewater and the development of uh, fluorid symptoms. So we'll, we'll keep a close yeah, eye on that. That's why we want to keep watching it yeah. and seeing yeah. if, if that expectation continues to hold true. Yeah. So yeah, this is this big this is this big jump in the last week is sort of sort of concerning. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? For, anybody else have any questions for Kirk? Hearing none. Appreciate you coming, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Okay, you don't, I don't see. Public any. health, I don't know. There's an LH as an attendee, but I don't know if that's Lori Terrell from the community health clinic. Um, I don't know if there's a way to find that out. Um, uh -huh. We can work on that. Maybe yeah, we can work on that. And we then- can, Let's um, go ahead with Ashley with the environment services, health services report, and maybe we can figure out that's the word. Okay. Ashley, welcome. Hi. Thanks for Hello, being everyone. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through some notes I have for each of the three environmental sections. I'll start with foods first. Um, our food section participated in Lemonade Day University on Saturday, April 9th. It was a big success. Um, they had almost double the participants this year compared to last year. So that's great. We're going back up to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, they had about 90 to 100 children in attendance. And then Lemonade Day is scheduled for June 18th. Uh, the summer's farmer's markets are gearing up. There are about 35 vendors so far. Um, so that is underway. Um, 
both large summer markets, I'm sure the city market and the Woolery market, you know, have already begun. Um, more and more vendors continue to apply for May and June as the weather's getting nicer. Uh, there will also be three more smaller markets that we're aware of, um, the Smithville market, as well as two people's markets that are underway. Pitch uh, days for, for foods is May 20th and May 21st, that festival. And then this year we've had 28 new restaurant facilities open so far. So they're keeping very busy. Um, there are 15 pending facilities currently, four remodels and six new openings in April. Uh, the Taste of Bloomington planning is underway. Um, this is the first time it's been in person since 2019. So um, that's great. They're shooting for about 40 vendors and five mobile vendors. Um, and then the restaurant meeting for the Taste of Bloomington is June 8th. Our food staff will be doing a food safety presentation for all those participating vendors on that day prior to the event. That's all I have for foods. Um, for general environmental, uh, Cody and Simeon are working really hard on our annual report goals, which is great. They went out on their first tattoo parlor inspection um, as requested by the shop for a look inside their facility. Um, the, the team has been working on developing a, an SOG for addressing those complaints that we get from um, either the parlors or patrons of the parlors. And then they've also created an access database for logging these types of complaints to keep track. Um, and then let's see. There, uh, we've also been working with, um, the other goal was a lead related goal. Um, and they were, the goal was to identify child, identify childcare facilities in the area um, and provide them with lead awareness information. The team contacted the de deputy director of childcare and licensing with the office of early childhood and out of school learning. Um, they currently do not, um, it says that they said, not at this time, we do not ask or inspect for lead. If we receive information from various sources like IDOH or item, we follow up as much as we can. So this was a good gap, I think, that our team recognized in trying to identify the households that, um, and households in other facilities that have children that might have um, lead risk. So they are working on drafting a letter and some informational packets to send to these uh, facilities that they've identified. Um, the team also worked on a case with the solid district, solid waste district in item, um, a property in the county just had lots of solid waste issues, um, potential mosquito breeding site. Uh, the, the property was quickly completely cleaned up. It was a really good collaborative effort among these different entities. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, the issue was resolved quickly. And then just as a final note, Simeon passed his lead risk assessor test. Cody and I both also pass our lead inspector tests. So we're on our way with training and we also set, uh, both pass our certified pool operator tests. Um, so that's what's going on in general. Uh, for uh, wastewater, sorry, if we need a break. Ashley, could yes. you tell me how many tattoo parlors there are in Monroe County? Uh, Is we have a list. I don't have it on me. I know it's about 10. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so for septic and wastewater, uh, the section has been working with Kendra on updating uh, pages on our website in the wastewater tab. Uh, they're continuing, continuing to make updates. Uh, the recently passed Senate bill, which I'm sure everyone has heard about, um, means big changes might be coming to our wastewater code. So that code will be, a code review will be underway in the coming year. Um, on April 20th, the septic wastewater team attended a class with uh, Mark Miller from IDOH about uh, septic dosing pump training. So that was a great learning experience. <clears throat> the staff are wrapping up their inspections for septic system installations from 2021. So we are getting caught up there. Staff are prioritizing new sewerage discharge complaint cases, new septic permit application reviews, site inspections, all the things 
They're working really hard. Um, Cheyenne had a really successful septic education webinar on March 31st. There were over 30 attendees online. Uh, the presentation is also posted on the Friends of Lake Monroe website if anyone would like to reference back to it. And then we got some wonderful feedback after that. And that's just the last thing I wanted to share. <clears throat> so these were some testimonials that we got. Uh, one person said, I would like to express my gratitude for your online septic system workshop. Even though I've done quite a bit of research on the topic, your presentation imp improved my understanding of a properly maintained septic system. And then another citizen said, I also took advantage of the online septic system program on the 31st of March and found it to be very informative. Thanks again for the great work that your organization is doing to protect our water source. So that's what I have from the three sections. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Ashley? I have a question concerning lead testing. Is that, is that an expensive process? Um, so current, it depends on the type of testing. Um, we, there are what we call lead check swabs, which are relatively inexpensive that, um, basically it's a, a little stick. Um, you break them and you can, uh, the swab on the end, you can test things in your home if they contain lead. Um, the other way is a lead paint chip analysis, which are not very commonly used anymore because no one wants to cut a <laughs> hole in their wall if they don't have to. Um, there's also XRF testing, which um, that device is very expensive. But once you have a device, um, taking the samples takes two seconds and it's, it's, so, it's so I guess I, so the basis of my question is that given the devastating effect of lead poisoning and at low levels, chronic, chronic, is lead testing done on a mass basis? Yes. It's done at either nine or 12 months in childhood. It's done, all kids are screened for lead if they show the physician. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then so if we identify cases, that's when case management would come in and try to identify the source of that lead poisoning in the child. Do we know how many, what the percentage of kids are that are seen by that age? I don't, I'm not aware. Ashley, do you have any, you, you get referrals if, if you, for that. Do, do we do have much, do we have much in terms of, I mean, I know of a few. <laughs> just, but, but. Well, I just think that probably the people that would be the least likely to have visited a physician for that thing would be the low-income people. And those oftentimes are the people that are most likely to be exposed. Actually, actually it, you know, most people, they're pretty, you know, our low-income people, most of them have Medicaid for their kids. Okay. And so well, that's true. And, yeah. and I, most of, I think our pediatricians are very conscientious about following, making those, okay. knowing that they're the most high risk. Great. And early in childhood, since you come in so often, um, they tend to, it, uh, we don't lose a lot of them. Okay. Maybe we do some, but Good. yeah. But okay. I, I think that at least. Just those, want to make sure that there aren't, you know, like kids out there yeah. being exposed. But those, you know, kid, those kids actually have, a, you know, method for payment, which is. Like that it exists. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> the ones that fall through the cracks are the ones that have no method of payment. Yeah. So, okay. so we're looking individually, but but we really don't have any aggregate data. Like if this isn't a reportable thing, you um, know, it's not. It's not. Okay. It's, it's actually this. It's, does lead have to be reported to to you? How does it get reported? Do you know? If there's kids positive for lead. Yeah. We we only we usually are just notified when it when a child. Um, has tested high for blood lead levels. Um, I don't yeah, I think, think there's any mass um, kind of testing. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, it's reportable. Right. Yeah. So, so I wonder if we could see those statistics uh, as a board, you know, like not, not now, but just on a routine basis, just to, you know, like once a year or something, what, you know, how many positives have we seen in our community? Mm -hmm. with a denominator yeah i think i think that's something we can definitely um share in the future i don't have it offhand it's not a high number at least that not that i'm aware of i will say um the state is also um lowering their well so potentially lowering their blood lead level elevation um to a much lower level so case cases might be um 
a lot greater this year if that threshold changes. Ashley, do we have, uh, as a department, access to an X-ray spectrometer? The XRS? My understanding, and Penny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that the state would be purchasing several and um, for local health department use. So we would have it on a, a, you know, basically a lend and we'd be responsible for maintenance, um, but it would be owned by the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ashley? Well, so we'll follow up on that and see if we can get any solid numbers. I don't think the numbers are very high. Like, right. Good. Yeah. Great. So, well, because you basically the kids get it from lead paint. Right. And you know, yeah. So it's been and it's when, when was lead when was lead taken out of paint? 1976 or something like that. It was a long time ago. I mean, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Even the house is burned. They didn't find it. What? No, they didn't. Yeah. Okay. If anything. Yeah. So. Yeah, anyway, yeah. So, I, I think that it's it's a it, it was more of a problem a couple of decades ago than it is now because there's just lead, less and less yeah, lead paint in the, in the soil too with uh you know leaded gasoline back in yeah the seventies and prior right but the, I can't remember the last year they made lead paint but it's been a long time it, long it was before I, it was before I started practice that's how long ago it was so yeah, really the the at risk population is considered um, housing prior to nineteen seventy eight. 78. Okay, that was something. That was 78. And I took yeah. it out. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I know there was a question for me when Kendra and I are having some background technical difficulties. <laughs> so um, the XRF machine we can get from the State Department of Health. Uh, so those are accessible to us. And that was part of the lead grant that we applied for. They didn't want us to buy them but we have the ability to get one, essentially borrow one on a long-term basis. So uh, we hope to do that. And yeah, we get them reported. They recently changed reporting levels, but we get them if they are an elevated blood lead level. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they're not reportable. Right. So yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I think that it's either, is it nine or 12 months that they get screened? I forget. So you know, I forget <laughs> because I, that's not what I do. If the nurses yeah. were on here, they could tell you. But I also know part of those changes in the new law was mandatory testing, but I don't recall up top of my head what the schedule is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's either nine or 12 months. Mm -hmm. And it may be 12 because it's, it's, I think they had to be crawling around and eating things first before. Yeah. yeah. And they may have added a, an additional one. They may in have there. since it's been a yeah. while since I've been in practice. So, okay. We don't, so thank you, Ashley, for joining us. Thank you. Um, do we have, we don't have anybody from the public health clinic yet. I, not unless this LH that's on here is that person. And I guess if it's Lori or somebody from the public health clinic, they could raise their hand. Yes. That might tell tech services that that was them. Um, otherwise, I, I'm not sure where they are tonight. Um, yeah. We'll keep an eye out for them. Yeah. And then I will just say tech services, can you uh, elevate uh, Kendra, so I've got health administrator from my computer. Can you, oh, she's there now. Uh, health admin, can you make that person a panelist? And she will share the Jamie slides from my desk. There we go. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> Hopefully that will work. Looks like okay, she's... I'm here. Look, can you, you want me to go ahead and share Jamie's thing? It yeah, says, yeah okay. did you find it? It says host disabled participant screen sharing still, so I'm not able to share. Even though I'm a panelist, I don't know. All right. Um, I have it pulled up. I found it, but it won't let me. Yeah, I wouldn't share my thing either. All right. Oh, here. Oh, oh, hello. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, it should just be able to hit share when you hit share, it won't let you. It still says host disabled participant screen sharing. There we go. All okay. right. Yes. Yay. Can you see this? Can you make it bigger? <laughs> Is that good? That's oh, good. good. Okay. Okay. Woohoo. And you're there, right? I'm here. Oh, hi, Jamie. <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay. I think we're ready now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, it's good to meet you all finally. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so since I sent the slides to you beforehand, um, we'll just jump right in. Um, so this slide is a little bit different than what was sent to you. Um, we recognized there was a glitch in that slide. Um, the data wasn't wrong, but the dates were. The dates just needed to be shifted to the right on yours that was sent to you, which would actually show 2017 through 2021. Um, the graph just did not want to let go of 2017, but fixed it. Um, and as you can see, we rebounded in 2021 and uh, where we were in 2019, which is good. That's positive. On the next one, um, I put this year's on the next slide. Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I put this year's first quarter in to give you an idea of how we're doing so far. Uh, typically, we get most of our revenue first and second quarter. And you can see this year, we're slightly above last year and are continuing to rebound uh, from 2020. And then the next slide shows all four quarters of the past four years. Uh, the jump in 2019 is from the food section, um, though I currently don't have the data as to exactly why. I think it might be a jump in mobile units. Um, the jump in third and fourth quarters last year were anomalies uh, due to higher amount of death certificates issued from the pandemic. The next slide, uh, this has each division isolated so you can see what the sections brought in over the last four years. Um, and then the one after that is the same data as the last slide, but it's separated by year instead of section. And that is it. It's all money. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about the financial report? Good to see that we're recovering some from the. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Although you don't want it from death certificates. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. It's an excellent point. Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. But we are also, we're seeing more restaurants open back up, get their permits. So those are good things. That's a good thing. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jamie. Thanks. So still not seeing anyone from Colbert's Health Clinic. We'll go to Penny's report. All right. So uh, just a few updates. One next Thursday uh, from three to five, we are having a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer thank you event. Uh, it will be at Fountain Square Ballroom, and Cook, in, Cook Group was kind enough to donate that space to us. So we're very grateful for that and looking forward. So uh, you should have gotten an invite, but you're getting an invite now too. If come and um, let our, some of our volunteers who are available and willing to come, let them know how grateful we are for them. So they put in hundreds and hundreds of hours and we could not have gotten through the vaccine clinics without them. And they worked at assembly hall as well as at the you know, uh, convention center and all the other outreach different places that we've done. So very grateful, glad. We had originally thought that we would plan something for last August, 
and then you know things started kind of falling apart and then every time we think okay we we can plan again and we're like we just have to do it we just have to do it no matter what we have to do it so we didn't want what to was wait the date, too long. it is may 12th so next thursday in time three to five down the square ballroom uh, we are finishing up with various interviews, including the health administrator. Um, we anticipate to be finishing up most of our interviews for the various jobs that we have open uh, soon. And we do have a, one of the new DIS is starting on Monday. So we're okay. moving forward with getting those positions filled. And we have the temporary environmental health position. We have a part-time environmental health assistant um, vacant as well. And so we're about to close up on those. And the LPN position, we did go and get permission from county council to have kind of a secondary job description for that job so that if we couldn't fill it with an LPN or we found a really qualified, really good candidate that maybe they were an RN or maybe they were a medical assistant, but they weren't an LPN that we could still hire them and we could just use whichever job description fit. But um, so we're moving forward with that. That put us on a little bit of a pause. So we're pleased about that. Our vaccine administration reimbursement money, um, the state for all these clinics were billing that administration fee that you could charge uh, on health department's behalf and they are, giving that to us kind of is a grant just because that's the mechanism to do it. Although if we get the money that's come back and we are expecting those funds, we have been expecting them for some time. And so we keep having to follow up with that, but we're supposed to come by tomorrow. If they don't come, then we'll be following up on that. But we know that we have at least one check that is over a little bit over $168,000 and then there should be another one coming. So those funds that Dr. Payne at the Indiana Department of Health said that they can tell us which clinics, what, what amount of money came from which clinic. So those will go back to those clinics. So Indiana University will get funding back for the clinics that they did for us. And we'll keep a administrative kind of a small portion of that just for managing those funds. Um, and then the public health clinic will get the money for the people that went through our clinics. So I feel like that's a good way to share that, that money and keep it going for immunizations and those things. Codes, we are starting to gear back up. You know, in, it, we had a process every year. We went through local codes and reviewed those and our fee codes. And in 2020, we made the assignments and the pandemic hit and it's really stopped everything. So we actually had a meeting today to go over that process, kind of reevaluate the forms and the documents, make some updated updates and revisions, and then we'll be doing that. So we know that the big one we have to do this year is the septics because of the state changes, the state law changes. So we'll be looking at that. I know it's making Ashley nervous because it's pretty big, uh, but there probably will be parts of that code that may just need to go away. And Lee will be calling you to go over that um, with us. And then there'll be some portions that you know we can keep and, and adapt. But for the most part, the new state law is taking out our ability to dictate. We cannot be more strict. It takes out our ability to say you can or can't put it in. If an engineer says it fits, then it fits. So um, that's, that's any engineer or soil scientist. Yeah. So, um, and that goes into effect July 1. So we have a year in which we can change our local codes. The state has a year to change the state code. So we'll want to make sure that we're aligning with them as well. But I would say for the most part, we'll want it as simple as it can be. The areas that we can um, set standards, we will, and the rest will just and this, and go away. Yeah, this is regardless of who's paying the engineer. Yes. Not that I'm implying anything. But. Yes. So it is worrisome. And then we also want to kind of really look at, we were looking at campgrounds. 
I think that Monroe County had the campground, that's travel trailer, but we refer to it as campgrounds uh, code before the state had their campground code. And there are some even definitions and things like that that we need to clean up. And the state handles most campgrounds. So we found that most health departments don't do campground inspections. Um, so that's something that we just want to look at closer. And we had started that in 2020. We want to come back full circle to that as well. We've been meeting and talking with the state, we gave you a letter, you know, some concerns about even liability for some things. The letter from the state talks more about doing real estate inspections and the liability that there may be with that as well. So we're looking at all that. I say all that to know that we are right now having some discussions about what that might look like. If we change something, do it different. But I think it will come up next month when we also start talking more about the budgets um, and what that might mean. So in, in terms of reviewing the codes and also we haven't done the fees for it. Right, for and that would be one of them <laughs> as well, right? Yeah. So. Normally we had been doing fees every two years, right. which is still a lot. Um, the, the positive about doing it every two years for us was it was easier to say, okay, we review it on an even number and they go into effect on an odd number. Uh, but you know, there may, that may be even too soon. It, it's hard to kind of keep up with that. But if you go to every three years, it's harder to keep track of in your head, right? right. And, and the um, re yeah, the reason, as I recall, we decided to do every two years is because we had done it for like, what, 10 or something? Yeah, <laughs> and, you don't want to wait right. forever, <laughs> right? And, and so the jumps were like really, really big. Yeah. So the, the, the rationale between mm -hmm. doing it more frequently is that there would be smaller increases. It wouldn't be quite as right. hard on people yeah. if there are smaller increases. So I think that's why we decided yeah. to do it. And I think, yeah, three is a weird number. It is, it makes it harder. So yeah, just it, something to think about. And two, we may just want to keep it at two. Yeah. And when did we do it last? Well, we were going to do it in 20 and yeah. we didn't. We didn't so, so yeah, so it, really should it's do it. on the so, normal yeah. cycle. So right we should now. absolutely do it this year. And when in the year would we anticipate doing that? Well, so the process that we had in place was normally the first quarter we would make those assignments and then staff would have roughly four to six months to make the changes and do the research. Then they usually come to you at the October meeting. That's just sort of the process mm -hmm. we've had. Um, and then if you approve those, then we have November and December to get them to the commissioners to approve so that they can go into effect in January. So that's been kind of the process. It's a good timeline. Is that yeah. feasible, you think, again? Yeah, yeah, and that's, like I said, we're behind, obviously, for reasons that make sense. But we've today we reviewed and re kind of revised the documents so we can get those out and get started on those right away. So we should, we'll have that yeah. as a goal. For this yes. Year. That's good. And the codes will set big ones, big ones. So. Yeah, and that's part of what we were trying to do too, is look, are there any other ones? Because we can, while we're doing this, we can reevaluate the cycle and what comes first. And yeah. so we can prioritize the ones that need to be taken up. You know, maybe there's some, we say septic, for example, fees we want to do this year, but we could leave this one to next year or something like that. Does anybody have any problem with that? Yeah. You okay with that, George? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and then we're in the middle of our after action report for COVID, even though it's not over, uh, trying to identify strengths and weaknesses. You should have gotten an invite to that survey. Um, if you didn't, check your spam. And if you still don't find it, let us know and we'll resend it to you. Okay. I think it should have come probably from Christina Kemp. Won't come from me. Um, but we can resend it if you didn't get it. Yeah. And there's a live session too. Yes. Yeah. Se several live mm -hmm. sessions. I think I may have missed that. So, yes. So just you can just fill out the survey. You can join the live session and, and do it there as well. But there's categories of those live sessions. So I think we're in the sort of government officials section mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's only offered one time. So, so check your spam. Yeah, and mm -hmm. in all clarity, you could attend a different one, but but they will be sort of focused around that topic. So, yeah, if you want to sit in now, we as staff, we will 
going to be there to say welcome and we will step away. So we will not be in there so people can talk freely. So how much fun is that? I know, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. So, and then just kind of COVID updates, as Kirk talked about, cases are steadily increasing. Water sampling is really supporting that so far. Um, and today that they jumped. So that was something I was going to share. And really, it's an opportunity for us to just really monitor the data and see if what we anticipate will happen will happen. Um, and if we will see those bigger numbers in the next week, right? There's lots of activities that have been happening over the past few weeks. I mean, from not just Little Five, but there have been proms and other kinds of graduation parties, and you, we've got graduation, lots of things going on, uh, galas, and, you know, just people are doing things that they haven't done. So lots of opportunities really for spread at this point and so we'll continue to watch it we have been if we start seeing um, other increases or concerns we'll do another press release we shared earlier that we were going to a medium level doesn't really change the recommendations um, and i was trying to look before we came in here and the cdc hasn't changed it may actually drop back to low today it may not um, I'm always a little leery about saying what it will do for certainty because I may anticipate that based on what I'm seeing in the numbers. But because our numbers drop back below 200 per 100,000, um, we had a jump in data a couple of weeks ago. The state had like a data dump. So it was old reports that got entered and those got calculated into everything. So even though our numbers were rising, they weren't necessarily at that level. So. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yes. This has to do with the report you had in the packet about the school liaison. Are you gonna talk about that? Oh, I can. Um, I was confused a little bit. I know I know that, that, that um, there's a fair amount of leeway in that, but I was, maybe you can, if you can find that. I yeah. The, COVID, the school liaison. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. So, and, and let, me just, let me just state that I think that hearing and vision and dental screening is really, really important. But can you tell me how that connects with the COVID thing? It is because that's what's in the grant, honestly. And really? part of it is this. <laughs> okay. Well, part of it is that during COVID, not only did students not get their routine immunizations, okay. They were also missing hearing, vision screenings, those kinds of things that schools tend to offer at least once a year. Okay. And so they want them caught up on everything. Okay. So it has to do with that. Okay. Yes. That makes up. Now it makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Makes, and we've had. I'm a real fan of screening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Emily did a good job of making some connections to some schools, to some other alternatives. So it doesn't have to fall on them, but they can make arrangements for their students That's to have good. that access. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we've had several schools sign on for the grant and the commissioners have approved those. Um, so um, we're expecting some more of those as well. Great, thank you. I think that's it. Okay, sorry, is that you have more report? No, I, I think that's you? it. Okay, the, okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Any, anybody have any questions for Penny about anything that she sent or anything? <laughs> Hearing none. <laughs> we still don't have public health people up there doing it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm maybe, not sure. Maybe oh. we can just ask them to send us a brief report by email or something. Oh, what's H A? Oh, that's up. Don't I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, um, Beth Carpenter. Yes, if Beth Carpenter is public health clinic. Yes. Please well, elevate yes. Beth Carpenter. Yes. Great. <laughs> Beth Carpenter. Yay! Welcome. Hi, Beth. <laughs> there you are. I can see your forehead. Yeah. Oh, no, it just now it just now allowed me to join when you said my name. I've been listening to you, but I've not been able to speak or uh, get on anything. Oh, great! I'm glad you're with us. Thanks for coming. We're ready for uh, your okay. 
Okay, sure. Um, just let you know our COVID, uh, grant, COVID grant was extended. Um, this will help us uh, keep our uh, PRN stuff for the outreach and continue to grow and um, meet the upcoming possible needs that we will have as we um, get ready to in possibly June have the five to 11 boosters and then um, the six months, four year old um, coming up. So we're trying to gear up and have a plan in place and um, have, have staff available on hand um, to be able to um, um, be able to fill in the needs as the demand grows for us. Um, and also still working on the plan for um, the days we're gonna be um, open more of the evening to extend those hours and then the weekend hours. Um, we're still working on the homebound clinics. Um, we still have some from the 211, so those are still coming in. It looked like they were going to end for a while, but those are still coming on. Um, we're continuing the uh, wellness outreaches, and we've completed the fifth, sixth um, um, catch up immunizations, and um, we're still doing the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades um, to do. Uh, that and as you guys are well, we're um, watching for the um, test kits to come in. So and making plans to get those out. Okay. I've heard from people that they can't get appointments to get the Moderna vaccine in Bloomington. They they've been having to go to other counties to get it. What do you what do you know about that? No, we have Moderna and there's appointments available. You can get them anytime. <laughs> yeah, I got mine there about. 10 days ago. Okay, so, so this yeah. is, they're just misguided then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm good with being misguided. <laughs> okay, so, I, <laughs> so you do have appointments it. available. You know, I wonder if what they're seeing, because at the public health clinic, we're now, they're now taking appointments directly there. So, so if they're the going website. on the map, okay. so they can't, they won't get that direct link. So I that's, that's it. it. Okay. So. Why aren't they on the map? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. because that well they should be on the map but not have a link to SOTEC for scheduling so we can check on that yeah I just that because yeah. I mean if people are having trouble getting appointments and they're available that and it and it's not we just we've we've shared that information but you know over the last several weeks that we were taking appointments actually last few months whenever you started it's been a while now yeah but, so yeah. we can we'll check on that and then that might be a good well, update what, that we can give one of the things that's happened i think among most of the people i know is that they've all stopped taking the newspaper because it's been uh, and they there's, i mean i get the digital paper but i don't check it every day we, get, we still get them but, but I, almost everybody i know doesn't even take the paper anymore so it's really, disseminating that information i think has gotten really difficult yeah yeah, social media is probably as useful as anything, as much as I hate yeah. to say that. But, yeah. <laughs> but is, is there any way we can use social media to let people know that? We, I mean, I, I just. Yeah, we'll check on the link because we have done that. But we can check on the link and see what's going on with the map, and then we can can disseminate that. What's, what's the phone number to make an appointment there? 353 uh, 3244. Three, four. Is that the number, that, Beth? That's correct. Yay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to send it out to a few people because yeah. I've. Yeah. yeah. They're definitely available. They're open. Great. Thank you. Anybody has any questions for Beth? Okay. Good luck getting everybody caught up on vaccines, Beth. All right. Thanks. You guys have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming. We do have a really nice and, um, you know, we do some movie ads like through the movie theater. So whether you do online, we have a really nice new one um, about catch up on your vaccines that should be coming. So we'll send that out to you. We bought one so we can put it up on our website as well. So um, we'll we'll send that link to you so you can see it. So I think it's really nice. And I would try to show it to you right now, but I'm not going down that road. <laughs> We've had a few challenges yeah, here today. Right yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Beth. Is there, um, is there, Kendra, is there anybody who wants to do a public comment out there? 
if anybody wants to do public comment, if they use the raise their hand and then tech services can let them tell us who it is and Here, no, no, we can come back to that later if anybody shows up. We have some old business. We have to approve this beautiful annual report that's all in front of you. You've got it electronically. I'm sure you've had time to review it. Yes. Is there anybody yeah. have any issues <laughs> with it? Oh, it's, Since if, if so, it's as good as the past ones, then I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it will be. I have not read it yet. I, I, have, read, I have read it cover to cover. You, you, you printed it. You I printed it and yeah. I will make them I had the opportunity to look at this the other day. So that's really, um, so. I guess we need a motion and a second to. They made it. I made it. You made it. Oh, I said I'll make quiet. a motion. Though. Okay, and I need a second. 2021. And we have Steve and second it. Written. Or maybe I shouldn't second it because I haven't read it. <laughs> okay, take second. Mark, Mark will second. <laughs> Mark will second. Okay, sounds good. So we'll, we'll take a vote. Just for the sake of that. Uh, so uh, we're voting on approval of the uh, annual report. Steve. Yes. Mark. Yes. Bob. Yes. Okay. Yes. George. Yes. And I vote yes. So it passes unanimously. Yay. Okay. And then we have the Chom and Chip. The Chom and yeah. Chip. <laughs> so we did complete the community health assessment that is up on our website. So if you want to look the whole report, it is on our website so you don't have to print it. <laughs> we will print a few copies. So if you want one, I'll get you a copy. Uh, Kathy and her team did a great job putting that together. We held two think tanks last week, one on thir Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, I think it was, and then on Saturday. And we probably had, I don't know, 25 or 30 people at each one, which seems small, but for a meeting like that, it was a pretty good turnout. Uh, we didn't we got lots of great feedback and ideas. Uh, the kind of the priorities that uh, surfaced mostly weren't surprises. They were things that were around equity and um, housing and substance use and mental health, uh, navigating uh, access to care, that kind of thing. So the team is kind of bringing all of those. We had two sessions and they each kind of selected priorities. And so we're bringing that together. There's an opportunity online to look at it and provide feedback. So we're pulling all of that together to kind of hone in on those priorities. And then in the next few weeks, we'll be calling the teams together. So the community, the people that said, yes, I'm willing to work on these projects, right? And we'll outline those, we'll pick normally three, maybe four priorities that we will work on and start coming up with some strategic action items for how we can address those as a community. So it's not the health department's plan, it's really community driven. And um, IU Health, City of Bloomington, Parks and Rec uh, have been partners forever, Indiana University, uh, but also CJAM has been, had a grant a Robert Wood Johnson grant for Community Voices for Health. And they've been working on that for now a couple of years. And they joined us with this effort as well. And they did a lot of in-person interviews with people. So we were able to take that information as well. So go online, it's on our website. You can take a look at the full assessment. We're very, very pleased with that. So that's moving along. Any questions about that? Well, that's a lot of work, and thank Kathy. Yes, that's great. Yes, yeah, yeah, and the the report's excellent. Um, and like I said, lots of good information in there. And then but Melanie, what is, what is sorry? What is CJAM? CJAM is Community Justice and Mediation Center. Oh, okay. That they've come up before. Yeah. They, actually, they were inserted into our strategic plan mm -hmm. as. A connection. Yes. I remember. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes. So, and does Kathy feel supported by all these partner agencies or is she is she like just kind of bearing most of the burden for no, we're very supportive and um, the community voices for health, they have a lot of different groups. So brought in extra facilitators for these sessions, uh, volunteers. So I would say very supportive. That's great. 
And, you know, Melanie is now, we've filled our harm reduction specialist position. And so now Melanie's able, that we're at a point now where kind of Kathy can really start and Melanie start feeling out that senior environment, uh, senior community health specialist and the population health manager roles and sort those out. So that's great. we're excited for that. This is a, one of the things that I just think is impressive is how well various people in the community cooperate mm -hmm. to get these things done. Yeah. It's, it's nice to be in a community where people cooperate. Yes, absolutely. So, okay. That's the question, which if we're finished with that topic, I don't see it on the agenda, but you know, we got the letter on real estate inspections. Are we going to talk about that? that all? That's what I referred to when I was talking about the codes that we're looking at the oh, oh, reviewing oh, yeah. the codes. Okay. And um, so real estate inspections is one of those things. Um, so the staff, Ashley, we talked earlier today about that as well. You know, we can look at what are we doing? Could we offer real estate inspections, but be very careful. These are the yeah, three things yeah. we are looking for and we're only going to tell you we observed it or we didn't observe it and we're done and that's what you get for this amount of money and if you want more than that hire out yeah. or maybe we say we don't do it at all right and so there's still some research in terms of other counties um and just in general, it will be a small loss of revenue. So it's something, that's why I wanted to mention it now. So you have some time to kind of process that. Um, campgrounds is kind of the same way. Um, our local campground code says that we shall inspect twice a year, um, but campgrounds really falls to the state. So we don't, we, would, we put that on ourselves. We are, I think, and I have to go back to 2020 when we started that process. I think we, we are one of, if not the only, we are one of very few counties that do campground inspections. So, uh, so those were things to think about, but they will result in a loss of revenue in that sense. So we've got to just think about that whole balance and what we need and can we do it differently? But do it, you know, there may be a reason to just change it. Were, were there problems when we inspected that stood out that we need to be aware of when we make our decision? on whether we're... Some, and we can have staff. Yeah, so that's, that's what we want to really, there are pieces in our campground code, even definitions that no longer match the state. And so they, we can be more restrictive there, but it creates conflict. So there are definitely things that would need to be cleaned up. One option for campgrounds would be to say that we don't, we don't take out the shall, right? We're not automatically inspecting them, but we will take, for instance, the lead on behalf of the state if we get a complaint, right? Which is what's going to happen anyway, right? But if there's a complaint, the state's going to call and ask us to go out and then report back to them. And then we're going to work with them on it. So it could be as simple as making little changes like that. So is the state inspector campground? Yes, but not, I would say that shall, you know, yeah. you get caught up in just think, you know, know, we have people coming from other places who don't have the ownership of the county that we do mm -hmm. that I, I'd like to make sure they're behaving well. Yeah. yeah. Especially when we have a, the largest body of water that mm -hmm. has our drinking source yep. in the whole yeah. state, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, and again, there are change, you know, it may just be small changes. It may be that we don't stop doing them at all, but it may be that it's simply a change to it. Yes. We like to protect our water. But it definitely needs to be cleaned up to match the state code more closely. Yeah. And, and if I, I enjoyed, enjoyed would be the wrong word. Uh, I was interested in the small paragraph here that, it, that points out a small, relatively small loss of revenue isn't as concerning as a potential liability as yes. it is, which would cost us a lot more if we were making statements outside of just, it seems to be working, yes or not, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, yeah. but at least our, our uh, uh, Ryan Cushman has addressed that in here in his letter. Well, so, that letter is from Mike Mettler. 
who is oh, from, oh, I see. Yes, yes. It's and to, he addressed it's it to, it's to him. Yes, yes. Right. I, right. I and that. Mike Mettler is from the Indiana Department of Health over the Environmental Health Division. But yes. At least, but we knew this, right? I mean, we knew this potential liability. Yeah, existed, but I but think he's pointing it out very much, and that's why we talked about if we're going to continue to do them, then being very clear that this is all we're going to tell, all right. we're checking, all we're telling you, and we're not, you know. This is so. working now. This is not a prediction of future results. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. Yeah. But I just, I wanted to bring that up tonight again, so you have some time to mull it over it as we get yeah. ready to talk okay. about budgets. Yeah. Okay. So any more old business. Do we have any public comments yet? Seeing none. Um, good asking. <laughs> um, so new business discussion of 2023 budget priorities. Yeah, so here we are. <laughs> thinking about the uh, previous strategic plan and one of the things is we present the annual report and information as we go along and you all as a board kind of talk about what priorities you want us to think about as we're preparing for the budget. So one nice thing about you meeting more often is that we have a meeting between now and July when we have to give you the budget to look at, right? So and we can hardly wait. I, I know. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to kind of, again, plant the seed so that you can kind of think about things that at the June meeting we can really talk about kind of where are we, what do we, when we look at the budget and what we've spent, what do we think we need, right? But are there certain priorities that you want maybe to handle differently? Do you want to look at more money for prenatal or, or keep it the same? Do you, um, you know, again, talking about the code, if we change things with some of those, are we okay with that in terms of the revenue? And so I, one, my big thing is that, you know, we've had now the temporary environmental health specialist for two years, I think asked for that to be permanent. Um, and I think that that's a pretty easy ask and hopefully. We, we originally were going to ask for a permanent position. Is that a different and, and, temporary? I think it might be a different temporary one to make permanent. No. Uh, well, that we Kendra's position was part time, and we made it full time. We added the temporary environmental health specialist position when we had somebody go on military leave. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And we had COVID, right. and we didn't want to, you know, not have that position. Um, and we certainly have kept them busy and we certainly can keep them busy. And we see that position really being able to do a variety of things, including if COVID kind of rears its head again, that you've got somebody that, hey, you're the first person kind of pulled from that division, right, to help in another way. So we can definitely use them and keep them busy. There's no reason not to ask for them to be permanent. I think we've got two years of that and and we would still have somebody in that position, but they got offered a permanent job. So you can't fault somebody when they're in a temporary position. Um, but I think it's going to be reasonable to, to So that would be my big ask. Are they the big asks, asks other than asking? Is you well, mentioned, you mentioned I, actually, the if I, if I could, Penny, you, you might want to uh, Who's going to be taking minutes at this COVID critique, all those sessions? Like, is some, who's going to be taking notes? If staff aren't going to be there. Oh, the after action report. Yeah, yeah. We're, we've hired that out. Okay. Uh, and so some of those will still be recorded. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so it might be an opportunity to extract some um, budgetary implications going forward from those feedback sessions. Absolutely. Right, because that's that's kind of that's going to give us a sort of a gap analysis in terms of what is not being met in terms of expectations that we could put in the budget. Absolutely. And I think politically it would be a good time to maybe use that to our advantage. What what's the timeline on getting that report? We should have it by mid-June. 
So, be so it will be closed. Was our next board meeting? The 9th of June. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be but, looking. I'd be looking for one big thing to come from that. But we should have feedback by the ninth, so we may not have that final report, but we should have some feedback. So we'll by put then. that on the agenda. Yeah. Good. Good. Very excellent point. Um, you mentioned the prenatal clinic. Did you mention that because they keep asking for more money, or what? No, they haven't. Just because we use the local health maintenance funds for that, um, so it's just a, just an example. Uh, okay. Just is there anything else you can think of that, having lived through the great COVID pandemic, um, um, that you saw the huge hole in the fact there's just not nearly enough people. Yeah. It. You know, I talked to the chamber and the hospital luncheon yesterday, and um, it's the, the challenge that I saw with the pandemic was people started, you know, what do you need? Here's money. You know, well, even the state with some of their grants, here's this, here's that. And it's, you don't, if, if we don't have the infrastructure and the systems in place, you're throwing money at me and every health department in the state will say the same thing. You're throwing money at me and my the systems are not built for that. You know, from going to county council to get it, you know, you're telling me you're gonna give me, I don't know, $100,000. Okay, when are you really giving me that grant? And now I need to use it by when, four months from now? Well, it's gonna take me two months to get the money appropriated. And then if I need to hire somebody, I need a new position and there's a process for that. But those are the big challenges with people throwing money at you, right? Um, so I think just um, trying to figure that out. I think, you know, we've talked before kind of Epi, but even technology-based things, you know, like people wanted dashboards and, you know, well, the state put up dashboard, but being able to have that, um, but there, you know, where do you have money for those things? And then who's going to, where do you get that data and, you know, put that in so that you can turn around and give that information out? Can, can you define a position that a epidemiologic technician <laughs> you know yeah I mean, we probably you, i mean is that a well that, so we probably yes we probably could but the remember the county went through this whole job description review and so you can't put that in next year's budget because you don't have a job description and it is reviewed and approved and they're not doing any right now like i mean unless like we got the school liaison. That's a good way to keep the staff down is yeah, require a slotting, a whole slotting. So, you know, we got the school liaison because we had a grant that required we have a school liaison, right? And they pushed it through for us. So county council supports us, but there is that. So you can't go to budget and say, I want a new position that hasn't already been figured out. So do we have any positions figured out that could be well no because they haven't also haven't been taking any because they've been doing this whole process but that is something that you could say all right we we're identifying this need or that need and in 2022 between now and spring we're going to say we want this position so it might be 2024 but even if it were approved in 2023, you wouldn't be the first department to then get the job, get the job description, and then go and say, by the way, we want to add this to our budget now. You wouldn't be the first department yeah. to ever do that. Yeah. I, you know, I just having being on the downside of, of everything you all did the last two years and knowing how hard you worked and many other people in the department had to work with extra time right to get just to do anything it's, it's absurd right it's, and it, it's, it's it's irrational to think that we're never going to have another pandemic and that things are going to it's so yes. to not be prepared for that right where we're not you know right beating and everybody down doing this i mean you guys were superhuman in, in what y'all did yeah they were amazing oh um, well, you were too i mean it's just every it's, and to to expect that something like that's never going to happen again 
is unrealistic. Yeah, but it's like it's also fiscally irresponsible to hire a bunch of people who are going to wait on a pandemic. And like, how do you like <laughs> how how in the world do we manage these things in the future? Right. Well, I, but I think it's quite clear that the department, even on a good day, is underfunded. Um, right. So <laughs> there's a, there's a deficit that's existed for a long yeah, time. Yeah, you, you started at a deficit. So yeah. So and I always go back to space. So you know we've got good space. We don't have extra space for extra staff. So if you're asking for ex extra staff, we've got to figure out where you're going to put them. Are you going to say, well, we do have remote remote work. Do we have those those kinds of things now? What positions could do that? Because they can't, you know, um, and how are we going to manage those positions? A lot of the things we talked about with space on the roof, they no longer have any parking. It's all taken away and all taken away. So, so we have sick people parking in the garage for next door. They, they could use a place that uh, parking. We took all the parking. But how big see, is it? Not that big. They see it. Like, can that just be a plus other place, leased somewhere else? Uh, does, it, just, does it have to be here? Is there well, a, the know? county built, I mean, it was originally um, the extension office. The county built it out as an exam, you know, as a clinic for them when they brought the employee health clinic to the county. That was kind of part of their agreement. So whether or not the commissioners would be willing to tell them they needed another spot. Well, that's one of the things we might have to talk about if we get more space. Yeah. Talk about. Um, it's, I do, it's, yes. It seems to me at least one of the solutions to this kind of problem would be more cross training and hiring up the people you really need to do the job day to day in all other respects. but cross-training them in order to be able to slide them into the slots you need when you need them. Uh, and that's one reason, you know, Ashley's working very hard to kind of figure out and get all of environmental cross-trained so that we can move people around there. Um, and you don't have to say, well, I can't move you because you're the only one doing that. Well, we now we've got three people that can do that. Um, so that's helpful. I do think the infrastructure, for instance, to say if something like this were to happen, and maybe it's some very general job descriptions that could be used for a number of things, that if this happened, now we've already got the job descriptions, we need to add these people, right? It, it could be some simple things like that, to, to your point, that because I think it's how do we ramp up and kind of ramp back down. You know, that's part of the emergency preparedness. Mm -hmm. is, but I think that's something we need to think about it because honestly, I, you guys did an incredible job. I don't know how you did it. I honestly don't know how you did it. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it was exhausting just to think about the work y'all did. It made it a lot easier to have to move across town for a while. Yeah, we did move and come back during all that. Yeah, it's just a little something else. But yeah. Nothing to that. Yeah, but, but I just think that. You know, the personnel is, is, is part of the issue with emergency preparedness, and I don't know how. I mean, you don't have the how you actually get that done, mm -hmm. but I think we need to be in position. Mm -hmm. Even if we can't ask for more people right now, right? But to be in position so that something happens in the future, or for example, COVID, you know, busts out again, mm -hmm. uh, that we can respond quicker and right. have the infrastructure and the things in place mm -hmm. to respond. Anything other discussions about the 2023 budget priorities? I like our priorities. I think we're doing, I mean, I think, you know, I think we are doing a lot of really good things and we're focused in the right way. So. Um, I do, I will say this that, you know, if you all go back to, and I assume at some point you'll go back to quarterly meetings, things will come down. <laughs> but I would say, adding that fifth meeting in June could be a really good move and make the budget meeting in July much quicker because you'd be talking about the money and where you want it early 
No, that's fine. And then, um, I mean, with me, with you know, fine. July. That that's just a future. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any real issues with having more frequent meetings. Frankly, I think it provides more continuity. And if so, you can always do them in a hybrid fashion. That means people who mm -hmm. you know, are out and about and can't get here physically can right. still participate. And the monthly meetings actually not that frequent compared to a few of those months <laughs> in the past. Yeah, yeah four or five weeks doesn't yeah. sound bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. no, actually, I, I, for the time every meeting, other month, you know, yeah, you could do every I'd, I'd rather have more shorter meetings than fewer longer meetings, personally. Yeah, so would I. How's that? Yeah, some things to think yeah. about. Well, what about and parking spaces? What about this? I mean, is this a help to us, or is this oh. a hindrance? No, no offense, George. No, it is because I was on I was on Zoom last time, and it was great. It, it, I mean, it was actually worked really well. I mean, I would just say, well, why can't we just come face to face going forward, or or is this helping us so much? I just don't see it as a problem. I think because, for I, example, I, if I can't come and I'm in South Carolina, for example, then I can still participate, even if I'm not in town. And that, that's and you know, Steve travels a lot. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of us, you know, I, you know, if someone has a cold, they can participate. I mean, it's like, you know, I just, I, I think that, and I also like the fact that we can have the public on there. I think without that's, them being here. Oh, it's yeah. not that they don't love the public here, but it's just it's so much easier for them to participate if, if you want the public to participate as well, which I really. And we don't have to have people crowded in this little room. That's the yeah. other thing, which I would prefer right. just uh, this group. Yeah. So I like to limit the number of people I'm around. Yeah. And but I just yeah. so I think there's some real advantages to this that I would. I mean, yeah. I, no, I'm not arguing to get rid of it. I'm just raising the question, you know, because I, I think that the advantage is public. That you know we've had, and of course the issues have been issues that bring people out. But we've had more media, more people at the meetings than we typically would have. So I would say for people to be able to join from a public comment or just informational standpoint is good. It's nice for staff that they can join even from home. And so they don't have to come back. You know, they don't have to come in and then go home. They, they can go home and join the meeting and, you know, those would be the advantages, I think, in outside of just you. If you all were, if it came to a point where you needed, you couldn't do hybrid, you have to have people, you can always ask to use the Nat View Hill room in the courthouse, uh, you know, the big room there and, and set that up if you chose. Frank, frankly, I hope we don't come to the fact that we I see this as an advantage over requiring us to be here. Although I do like having most of us in the room. I mean, it's, I'm, I mean, I'm all for interpersonal reactions because it really has more meaning. Does communication have a, a, a special meaning? But allowing people to participate like this, even those of us who might be gone and yourself when you're when you're out of town, I realize you're not arguing for or against. You're just asking, uh, but. Uh, I, I would be much in favor of continuing the hybrid, and I hope it never comes to, again to a time where everybody's required to be here. I really don't want everybody in this room, especially with the pandemic still waning, but you know, still in present. And uh, quite frankly, from a standpoint of personal safety, I like meeting this group. Yeah, and in fact, it's, I know the people in this room have all been vaccinated boosted. I'm comfortable with with yeah. this crowd. I'm not comfortable with people I don't know. Me too. And I don't want to be around people. I don't, I'm not comfortable with them. maybe never again in my life. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not that social to start with. So, <laughs> so the next meeting is June 9th. <laughs> yes, next meeting is June 9th, 9th 4.30 mm -hmm. at this spot. Yes. Either hybrid or in person. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we're going to adjourn. We need to move in a step like this. Yes. I guess move second. I think you only second. need a motion. I was in a meeting the other day Is and right? I said you do not need a second for adjournment. Okay, so we have a motion. So we're done.